Hello and welcome. I'm Rebecca Bryant, Senior Program Officer for OCLC Research. Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar on Research Information Management in the U.S. University Enterprise Environment, a case study from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Works in Progress is a webinar series and a place for us to present work informally and to get feedback from you. It's a venue for both those of us who work in OCLC research and also for those of you at OCLC Research Library Partnership Institutions. This is our first webinar highlighting how institutions are implementing research information management or REM functionality. We welcome your input and suggestions as we plan future webinars about REM and other topics related to research support. We're very interested in knowing on what you're working on that everyone else should know about, and we welcome your input for moving forward. So let us know. Before we get started, I have just a couple of meeting logistics to cover. First, to eliminate background noise and make it easier to hear the presenters, you're in a listening only mode during the presentation. If you have any problems throughout the webinar, please submit a chat message to OCLC Research, the host, and we will do our best to assist you. Our colleagues at Minnesota will deliver their remarks and then take questions at the end, but please feel free to submit questions as we go along. To submit a question by chat, access the chat panel by clicking on the chat icon with the conversation bubble at the top right of your screen if you're on a PC, or on the bottom right of your screen if you're on a Mac. Then type your question in the text box, change the send to option to all participants, and that's sort of important. Let me say that again. Change the send to option to all participants, and then click send. This will ensure that the presenters and all attendees can see your question. One final note, we are recording this webinar and we'll make the recording available online after as well as the slides, so you'll have the opportunity to watch it again or to share it with your colleagues. So with those housekeeping details addressed, I'm delighted to welcome Jan Franzen, who is the service lead for research and discovery systems, as well as Caitlin Baker, who is the biomedical librarian and research services liaison at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Our speakers today will talk about their experiences implementing a research information management system at the University of Minnesota and how that project has evolved and continues to evolve to support researchers, discovery, and administrative decision support. I anticipate that our speakers will talk for about 40 to 45 minutes, which should provide us with plenty of time at the end for questions and discussion. Jan will be speaking first, so now I turn it over to her. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks everyone for attending this morning. Yes, as Rebecca said, I'm Jan Franson. I am uh, the service lead for researcher and discovery systems. And for our purposes today, you can just think of me as the service lead for Experts at Minnesota, our research information management system. University of Minnesota is a very large institution. We do a lot of different kinds of research here. Uh, we educate a lot of undergraduates and graduate students here. And we are land-grant institu institutions, so um, a lot of our, uh, our work is promoting ourselves and working within the state of Minnesota. With all of that going on, and with all of these different colleges going on, uh, sorry, <laughs> it, with all of that going on, with all of these different colleges, we're always looking for ways that we can tell stories, that we can find out from each other what's happening at the university, tell each other, and also tell the state and other researchers around the world. With all of that going on, too, there's a lot of different uh, methods for tracking that work, for tracking particularly research outputs. I have to tell you a little bit about the different products that have evolved here because I'm going to be addressing them again later on in the presentation. Each one of these that I'm showing on the screen is a vendor, uh, a vendor vended program that we license and implement here, sometimes with our own branding, so I'm going to be throwing out a lot of names. But then behind the scenes, there are also a lot of little homegrown things that individual departments or colleges use as well to trace, to uh, keep track of research outputs. 
The products that I'll just mention here, the first one is Experts at Minnesota, and that's what I'll be mostly talking about today. The vendor is Elsevier, their product, Pure. It's sponsored by the libraries and by the Office of the Vice President for Research. Works is another application that we have. It's a, the vendor is Digital Measures, and it's sponsored through the Provost's Office, the Faculty and Academic Affairs. It's an internal-facing product. It does track research outputs as well as grants and awards and classes taught and all of the other information that you need for internal reporting for promotion and tenure. Academic Analytics is also an inward-facing uh, internal audience kind of program. What its uh, strength is is in taking information about research outputs at Minnesota and comparing them at an aggregate level to other institutions. There we go, Experts at Minnesota. I want to say a little bit more about that. So Experts at Minnesota has a public display. So um, you can go to experts.umn.edu and you can see a profile for every researcher that we have included and facing towards the, the public interface. Uh, behind the scenes, it also has, is a research output data source that we can draw from and use in different ways. I'll be talking a little bit about uh, both aspects, but primarily the internal facing, how we can use that data later. It's continuously updated, so people can go in and change their profiles and add new things to it. And we also have an automated flow of information coming in. We implemented Experts at Minnesota a few years ago, I think about four years ago now, and this was our original goal. We wanted to have researchers find each other and find different ways to work together, especially between different, uh, different colleges, different areas of research. We needed a way for them to discover each other in ways that they hadn't before and build teams. And well, you can't really build teams with just a list of names. You need to know something about what those people are doing. And one of the best ways to know what someone is doing is to look at what they've published. So we needed a way to pull together the names, the, the uh, organizations they were with, and their research outputs. We also wanted to be able to show who have they already worked with, who have they networked with in the past, who have they collaborated with in the past. Pure, the product Pure, before that, Elsevier's product, SciVal Experts, provided the base for that. And I'm going to describe this as three different layers. There's that platform, Pure, and then there's the people that make it up, which we're drawing from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities HR data, and then research outputs, which I'm going to call Scopus Plus. Uh, Elsevier's Scopus database is our, our baseline product for drawing in research outputs automatically, but then there are other ways you can get research outputs into the system. So let's talk through putting together those pieces. Okay, Pure. Pure provides a structured database. Uh, it gives us those profile pages automatically, both at the individual level and then rolling up to a college or a department or the whole university. It gives you the ability to search and a few visualizations. You saw one of them at least on a past slide, that, uh, that collaboration tree, the web is coming from, uh, from Pure. And then it does automatic Scopus imports for most of our researchers. It gives you an import tool for other sources, and then there's a reporting to, as, tool as well. The second layer is the organi organizations and the people, and that part is up to us. For that, we go to our system of record, which is our human resources data kept in PeopleSoft, which we can get at through the university's data warehouse. We also bring in grant data, and that's coming from the Sponsored Projects Administration database. We pull in, according to job code, what are PeopleSoft job codes and departments, mostly faculty, but not entirely faculty. If you remember, uh, you won't remember, I'll tell you back on the slide with the big M on it, uh, we have something like 3,200 faculty members, I believe, at Minnesota. But we, are, we have 6,000 people that are um, publicly facing in experts at Minnesota. We have a lot of other different kinds of researches, researchers, even including librarians, who do a lot of publication in our areas of expertise. We're bringing in college department relationships, who's in what department, and we update about three times a year. We'd like to do that a little bit more frequently, but that's just uh, what we can handle right now. Now the metadata, the research output data, that is a joint effort 
Part of it is, as I mentioned, part of the pure product. We do get those automatic Scopus imports for 5,400 of the 6,000 people that we have visible. And then people can log in and add their own, either by importing from another source or through just data entry. Now, why do we not import for, or do the automatic import for all 6,000 of those people? Well, this is why. If you think about Scopus, the, the Scopus database is a really good general database and you're going to look great if you pull in all your research outputs and you're in physical science, engineering, life science, medicine, those kinds of fields. It does a pretty good job if you're in the social science disciplines of bringing in all of your work, but not perfect. And it's not really so great at all if you are in a humanities discipline. Um, the focus is very much on, uh, on published articles. There are so many different kinds of research outputs in the humanities uh, that are not captured by Scopus. Okay, so this is not going to be news to any librarian, but I feel I need to talk through it a little bit. We all know that there's this universe of articles and books and book chapters and all of these other research outputs. And normally when you think about a database like Scopus or, or a more specialized one, you know that when you choose the database that you're going to search in, you are basically putting a limit on your search right from the start. You're trying to target a particular kind of information according to what that database specializes in. Um, but when you're, trying, when you're thinking about a more general database, one that's trying to be comprehensive, and actually I would say Scopus is an example of that, Scopus or um, say Google Scholar, they're still limited. They're, they're not curated in the same way. They are, they are to some extent, but they're also limited by the negotiations and the contracts that they're able to build with all of the publishers of that information. What ends up happening is that depending on what they can negotiate, you're going to get a slightly different set of data looking from one database to the next. And I think that's an important thing to remember with any data source you work with. Here's an example of two different disciplines. This is sociology and horticulture. These were real numbers at some point that I pulled just to do a comparison of two different sources. And if you look at sociology at the top, uh, it looks like source B does have more items in it for the people I looked for. Uh, but if you look a little bit more carefully, you can see that there's some really big gaps. It has more items because it happens that in sociology, a lot of people write book chapters, and Source A doesn't keep track of those. But in pretty much every other category, Source A is the one that has more items, from journal articles to especially books, and even a couple more conference papers. If I look at a different discipline, horticultural science, I see more in Source B, and it pretty much has more items in every one of the different kinds of sources I've looked at there. Uh, it's just better cover, uh, Source B covers that particular discipline better, better than Source A does. So the takeaways, well, obviously no data source is perfect. Those relationships are always going to be evolving, so you're never going to be 100% sure at a point in time what's going to be covered and what's not. The scholarly communication practices are going to be different from one discipline to another. So therefore, we can't really rely just on Scopus. In other words, we're going to have to do some manual curation here and make sure that uh, the, if we're trying to be comprehensive in uh, showing what our researchers do, we'll have to do a little bit of work to get there. But it's worth it. Let's think about that. What was our original goal? I said it was that the university wants its researchers to find each other and work together. You do need to know those things about what those people do, but Maybe what you can get from Scopus gives you a pretty good idea. Maybe it's good enough. Um, you have to really think about what your goals are for the system. And at the beginning, this really was, uh, you know, good enough. And there was still the ability to do that manual curation, but it wasn't as big a deal until people started asking us questions. So there are a lot of questions you can answer if you have a nice, robust set of research outputs. And these are some examples of the questions that we've been getting in the last three or four years as we've accumulated all of these, these data in one place. I'm not going to read through them all, but some of the people asking us questions are the Vice President for Research's Office, the Board of Regents, uh, the Provost, and then any number of different academic programs, centers, institutes, departments, and colleges. 
they've all got questions that could, get, could be answered if we had a nice, reliable set of research outputs. They're asking us the questions because right now with experts at Minnesota, this is about as close as we've ever gotten to that complete set. All right, now I've mentioned system of record a couple of times. And I'm going to say that system of record is pretty much what we're getting to right now with research outputs and experts at Minnesota. I mentioned it earlier with regard to our HR data, the system of record, PeopleSoft. Our grants data, the system of record, is, uh, is our SPA data, the Sponsored Pro Projects Administration. If I look at the highlighted station, uh, statement here, it says that there are, if we have a lot of different things coming together and nobody's really sure which one is right anymore, maybe you better pick one. So I think that we have, in effect, picked one with experts at Minnesota. What we need to do now is to take that and make it as, as good as we can. We need to have it be as accurate and comprehensive as possible, and we need to give people a way to get at that data when they need it. So how do we make that, make it more accurate? I've already said there is no perfect data source. Really, the author is the only person who can tell you for sure that that record you have is right and tell you for sure what is missing from it. We don't have any requirements here. We always say we have no, no sticks. We only have carrots for getting people to check their profiles and add information to them as needed. Um, but we think that if people know people are, that others are going to be looking at and using these data for decision making, they're going to be a little more motivated to take a look and make the, the data as, uh, as robust as it can be. Luckily, we're the libraries. And we have this secret weapon. This is a, a, just a picture of all of our liaisons and public-facing uh, librarians who are, each one of them, specialists in a particular area. They understand the scholarly publication habits of their discipline, and they know the people in those areas as well. And that's what we hope to leverage in order to get our data to be uh, as robust as we would like it to be. Now I'm going to pass it over to the person up in the top left-hand corner, Caitlin, and let her talk about that aspect a little bit. Okay, thank you, Jen. Uh, so my name is Caitlin Backer, and I am one of the research services liaisons here at the University of Minnesota, and particularly I'm the research services liaison for the health sciences libraries. Um, now, as Jan mentioned, uh, we really are hoping to get all of our profile holders engaging with this tool and confirming that, in fact, their profiles are accurate. Now, when you have over 6,000 profiles in a system, that can be a little bit of an ambitious task. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how it is that we are operationalizing this system and integrating it into the suite of services that our liaison librarians are offering to their faculty uh, in order to promote this system and have people engaging with it in that way. Now just a little bit of background about the University of Minnesota and particularly our liaison model. Uh, so as Jan mentioned, we do have um, a number of liaison librarians who essentially have that in-depth understanding of their disciplines, of the publishing practices, of the norms, and they have the existing relationships to provide effective services. Now we also have a team of functional specialists who you can think of as super liaisons or meta liaisons, uh, and these are individuals with an in-depth understanding of a particular area such as uh, copyright, digital humanities, or publishing services. And they can provide services to all disciplines, but they usually do so in conjunction with the liaison librarians so that there is that personalized, tailored approach to the services. Now, at its inception uh, back in 2012, experts at Minnesota um, essentially kind of straddled the line between functional specialists and liaison librarians in that it was an in-depth understanding of a unique service and a unique tool, um, but it was also engaging um, with faculty directly, with graduate students, members of the public, postdoc, with a wide variety of individuals, and so performing that kind of dual function. Um, now, one thing I do want to make note of is that even though I have two individuals listed here, it actually did total one FTE, approximately. 
Um, now, as you can imagine, uh, this did function effectively, but there were some challenges in it in that uh, liaison librarians perhaps weren't necessarily sure where their conversation or where their questions should be directed when you do have a tool that is as um, broad as experts at Minnesota or any research information management system could be. So it may be a copyright question, it could be more of a technical question, and so forth. Uh, and so oftentimes the questions may be going to other functional specialists, so they could go to the experts at Minnesota team, or sometimes the liaisons weren't fully integrated into the process, so questions from the users would not necessarily be communicated back to the liaison librarians. So one of the changes that we've made over time is to broaden out our support model uh, and to incorporate individuals with other areas of focus. Um, now one thing I would also point out here is that this still only totals approximately one FTE, so it's not necessarily that we have added a great number of people, but more that we've diversified the team that's involved. And I would particularly draw your attention to the communications piece there. So now rather than having one individual who served as the project manager and communicated with um, all of our external stakeholders and the users and the liaison librarians and any other individual, uh, instead we have two individuals who serve to take in the majority of those questions and then triage amongst the experts at Minnesota team or to the functional specialists where appropriate. But I think more importantly than that communications piece, is the fact that these individuals, uh, the communications leads, are also working to build the baseline of knowledge amongst the liaison librarians and empower those individuals to engage with their faculty about this tool and this service. And one of the ways that we are attempting to situate um, RIM is by positioning it as an extension of the library's existing expertise, and particularly an extension of liaison librarianship, by connecting it to those spaces where our liaison librarians already have expertise. So our liaison librarians already understand publication and citation data. Uh, they understand the potential limitations of different data sources like um, like our various databases, uh, and they understand how this publication data could potentially be leveraged for different purposes, as well as what the limitations of the data may be. Um, but most importantly, they have the existing relationships and can tailor services. So because they have those existing relationships and that in-depth understanding of their constituents, they're able to position this service and communicate it in a way that makes logical sense and is most impactful for those groups. Um, now, as Jan mentioned, we do have a reporting module in PURE, um, and this allows us to essentially get data that we're entering into the system out again in an intuitive fashion. Uh, and so because our liaisons can generate these reports, they have a really easy way to respond to some of the questions that they're probably already working on whether that has to do with looking at our collections policies and ensuring that we are collecting the journals that our faculty are publishing in, to responding to administration needs surrounding publication rates, um, or just looking at how certain things like publishing trends are developing over time. And really, we position these as easy wins for our liaisons in that these are questions that they're probably already working with that without a system like Experts at Minnesota um, and our reporting module would be relatively challenging to answer. Um, however, because we have this system and because we have this module, we're able to come up with really straightforward solutions to generate this information and then allow the liaisons to repurpose it and make those connections with their faculty and administration. Um, but beyond the questions that our liaisons are already asking, um, we also have a number of new possibilities that are created because we do have this system that is generating these publicly available profiles. Now one example of this is what we call the Achievement Gap Project. So educational disparities has been a pretty prominent topic of discussion in Minnesota. 
Um, and this is true not only uh, politically, but also a very prominent discussion amongst the media and one that gets a lot of publicity. Uh, and so, of course, it was important as a land-grant institution that takes our land-grant mission very seriously to show that we were responding to this need and that the research that was occurring at the University of Minnesota was helping to address this issue. And so the goal was to create this portal that would essentially provide an access point to describe all of the research that was occurring on this topic uh, at the university. Now, this sounds like a very simple task until you consider that currently we've identified 118 researchers who work on this topic, uh, and they are from a very wide range of departments, so 26 departments in total, ranging from political science to epidemiology to um, history to uh, pediatrics. Uh, and these individuals are across nine colleges or schools. And there wasn't necessarily a single point where they would all converge um, in that these individuals uh, were not necessarily being funded by the same source and they weren't necessarily using the same terminology in their publications to describe these educational disparities. And so ultimately our goal was to leverage experts at Minnesota uh, to create that single portal through this website, gap.umn.edu. Uh, and we also wanted to do this in a way that was not going to require um, a lot of development on our part, that wouldn't require any, um, say, internal programming time, for example. Uh, and so leveraging those existing systems. And we chose to do this in a relatively straightforward way in that, uh, and this is just uh, the profile of one of the leading figures uh, of the Achievement Gap Project, Michael Rodriguez. Um, but we worked with Dr. Rodriguez and some of his colleagues to add the selected keywords to profiles. Uh, and then because of the way Pure is structured, we were able to essentially create one saved search that would allow us to create that portal. So by accessing this single link, an individual could see all of the other um, researchers at our institution who were affiliated with this project and working in this area. So something that did require a bit of liaison time and librarian time, um, but not something that required any additional programming work or any in-depth technical understanding. So a relatively uh, low barrier approach to really um, showing how it is that the university was responding to this need. Um, now, we also do have an opportunity to use this data in novel ways um, outside of making it publicly available. Um, now, because publication data can serve so many different purposes, um, there are utilities for it beyond that which would be appropriate for experts at Minnesota. And probably one of our most prominent examples of this would be the Manifold Project. Uh, now, Manifold is one of the homegrown systems that Jan was mentioning earlier, uh, and it was developed for our medical school. Uh, and the intention behind it is to provide some customized measures, so not only citation counts and H index, but also relative distribution of metrics as well as some other customized metrics um, for reporting and assessment purposes. And this is an internally available system, um, and for good reason, in that this is not the intended use that we would expect of experts at Minnesota. This isn't the type of data that we would necessarily publicly display, but it is a project that is enabled by the fact that we have clean data for experts at Minnesota. So this tool essentially is combining uh, the HR data that Jan had mentioned with publication data from Scopus. And none of this would have been possible if we didn't have those refined profiles within Scopus that are then feeding experts at Minnesota. So without that disambiguation piece, we would not be able to use that clean data and repurpose it in this way. Um, but one of the things that I did want to emphasize is that all of those above projects were involving the liaison librarians. So none of them occurred separately or without uh, the direct involvement of the liaison. And that is really part of our goal of promoting a model of partnership and support. 
uh, in that we want to highlight for liaisons that this is not going to disrupt their existing relationships, that Experts at Minnesota is really another tool that they can use to enhance those relationships and that we can help them and support them in doing so, rather than that we will carry on conversations um, outside of their relationships and potentially cause some confusion there with the channels of communication. Now, one of the ways that we are working to get liaisons engaged is really to um, provide additional internal training opportunities, not only to build familiarity with the system, but also to build familiarity with the related concepts. Um, so individuals feel like they are well positioned to respond to some of the questions surrounding things like the limitations of publication data. Now one of the early steps and one of our early goals in getting liaisons engaged is to have the liaisons being active in maintaining their own profiles and by doing so building that necessary familiarity in order to uh, more effectively communicate that maintenance piece to their faculty and to other users of the system. Now moving forward, we hope to grow this integration and really um, cement experts at Minnesota and in research information management as a tool within the suite of services that's offered by our liaison librarians. Uh, and then to build upon this uh, with outreach strategies for faculty um, to promote the education not only of the system but also the benefits and the limitations of that system and what kind of opportunities are opened up so that individuals can use the system uh, in the most intelligent way possible. And in order to help enable doing that, we are again bringing in the liaison librarians to that conversation uh, so that we can make sure that we are responding to the needs that they are expressing and that are emerging, but also the needs that they are communicating to our, our from our faculty, rather. So on that note, I'm just going to pass things back over to Jan, who's going to tell us a bit more about next steps. Thanks, Caitlin. Now, um, everything that's Kate, that Caitlin has talked about really has served a couple of different purposes. One is that it's addressed a particular problem, a particular need on campus and made something easier, better, more accessible, more obvious. But then the other part of it is it's gotten more eyes on the data that's contained within Experts at Minnesota. More eyes means more fixing of problems, means a better data set in the end. Now we need to talk about how we're going to make, or how have we made, that data available. Right now, I can, myself as the administrator, give people access to the Pure API, which allows you to make calls into the system and pull out data that you might want to do something with. I do have a few people on campus, something like a dozen people have, uh, have asked me for those credentials and are doing little applications to pull information out, maybe to put on a website, or to feed another database or something like that. But you know what? I talked a lot about system of record earlier, and all of that data that you might want from HR or from uh, the financial services or student information or anything like that is available through the University of Minnesota's data warehouse. And that's really where, I, where we see this moving as well. We, we see our research outputs and experts at Minnesota as becoming a part of the data warehouse. Data warehouses are nothing particularly new. This is just an article I found online about academic data warehouses. I did a quick query of uh, academic data warehouse EDU and found a whole bunch of different sites for different institutions. I'm sure your institution has one too. So I'm think, uh, I'm, this is a, just a little diagram showing how we're thinking about this. Right now, if I think about experts, and you see it referenced there as DW experts for data warehouse experts. Uh, we are feeding in HR and financial information, the financial being the grant information. Uh, we're putting that into Pure, and then we could be pulling, Pure, uh, in, pulling information back out of Pure, and the information we'd be pulling would be the research outputs. We can put that all into one thing that I'm calling the experts data warehouse. It is not strictly a data warehouse. I know there are tech people in the audience who are, uh, are ready to jump on me for that. It is just a tiny little piece of what, we, what the University of Minnesota's data warehouse is. But it's my shorthand for it. The timeline looks like this. We are right now in the process of building an Oracle database that will pull data out of Pure and store it in, in a database that we can then provide access to uh, for whoever needs it on campus. 
They can then uh, pull the data using regular SQL queries, and they can combine it with other data warehouse information like HR demographics, things like that. The uh, phase two will be uh, something for the libraries to do to document and then train interested consumers. We think this is another place where the libraries really have primacy. We do understand uh, the research output metadata, the limitations of it in particular, and the power of it as well. So we would like to be able to educate people as they're using the data about what is the best practice for making use of it. Phase three will happen whenever our Office of Information Technology is ready for us. They are working on a next generation data warehouse, and we intend for the research outputs to be a portion of that. Some of the near-term consumers that we have for the data, the, the people that we know about so far who either are using the API or have a plan to, uh, to pull information from uh, experts at Minnesota. The first one is Works. I mentioned that earlier. That's our internal facing promotion and tenure uh, product. Not every college and department is covered by that, but many are, and they do make use of it. What we're hearing from the Works people is that people are starting to ask, why don't you just pull the research outputs from experts at Minnesota? I've already reviewed those and they're fine. And so that is indeed what we're starting to do. We've given them some batch outputs previously, but what we'd like to do is make it a more automated process where they can pull as they need it from experts at Minnesota. We're also investigating what kinds of data they have that's unique to uh, systems within the university. What is their, what are they the system of record for that we could pull into experts at Minnesota to create a, a more, a richer uh, profile. Not everybody uses works, so we also have been working with departments. We've trained a couple of people in departments uh, to be able to pull out reports as they need them for their own internal uh, faculty activity reporting, and we do intend to scale that up, again, with the help of liaisons. Caitlin mentioned Manifold, and so I will mention Manifold 2.0. Right now, we are pulling from Scopus directly, but since we're putting so much effort into experts at Minnesota, there are a lot of reasons why it would make sense to have that feed from the new data warehouse. Again, considering that we're going to have one system of record, let's always pull from that. Academic program reviews are another need we're starting to see. When a program needs to do a review of what they've been doing and what direction they need to, they, they have decided they want to go in the future, you want to generate some conversations, and one way to do that is to look at what have they been doing. What did, what did they do 10 years ago versus what have they done in the last couple of years? How have things changed? Where are they publishing? Things like that. And so we've, we're looking at ways that we can pull information out of experts at Minnesota to help generate those conversations. One of the primary uses we've seen for APIs is feeding websites. And we also see a lot of people just plain linking to their Experts at Minnesota profile from their faculty page. The Department of Horticulture, Horticulture sorry, the Department of Horticultural Science is one department that has done that with all of their faculty web pages. And what we'd like to have is something like maybe a Drupal widget or something like that, where they could just place that on the page and have it automatically pull in featured or most recent or something like that publications. So this is just a few examples of where this data can be used once we've got it all put together. And with that, I think we are ready to take a few questions. I see that there are some already in the chat, but I think I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to ask away. Great. Thanks, Jan and Caitlin. Uh, we had a couple questions posed, and I want to invite people to go ahead and type questions in. Um, the first question we got was about when counting works, are duplicates counted one time or as many times? Um, so questions about how do you merge records? Mm -hmm. So do you want to address that, Jan? Yeah, that's actually, that is an excellent question. And there's a couple aspects to that. One is that um, uh, Experts at Minnesota is built so that the research output is at the center. So for, say you have multiple authors on one research output, you, uh, you have one record for that research output, that, and that, then that record shows for each of those people. So if a change is made or something like that, it's only in one place. And that research output is only counted once when you're aggregating it all together. Now, the other aspect is if you talk about feeding in from different sources, yes, of course, there's a possibility that you're going to end up with duplicates. 
Pure does a reasonably good job of identifying those and combining them when it can, um, but it's not perfect in that regard. It will, as you're importing information, if you, the individual, is importing information, it'll notify you as it goes and say, hey, this looks like a duplicate, you want to review it first. So there is a little bit built into that. But then also, this is another place where the libraries have a lot of expertise. And we've talked a lot about the liaisons, but we, of course, also have people who are experts with metadata and uh, understand what, uh, how to combine things, how to determine whether something is a duplicate and to combine as necessary. Uh, Pure has, a, um, uh, has some tools for doing that kind of merging, and we have a couple of different kinds of people working on this right now, doing the very simple kinds of things where we have duplicate DOIs and you can look pretty easily and see whether something is a duplicate. We actually have student workers who are making a pass through and eliminating those kinds of duplicates. And then we have uh, full-time staff who are also looking at the data and working on the things that require a little bit more research to determine whether it's a true duplicate or not. Okay, so a great follow-up to that was that we also had a question that related not so much about publication duplication, but about name disambiguation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you mentioned using Scopus identifiers, uh, which is no doubt part of the whole pure infrastructure. Um, but then we had a question about are you using ORCID as well? So you want to talk a little bit about your plans for ORCID? Uh, at Minnesota? Sure. Uh, yeah, actually, we are a, a new member of, of ORCID, and so we're just at the start of that, of figuring out exactly how, um, uh, what steps we're going to be taking to implement ORCID. But we have had liaisons talking about ORCID to their faculty for quite a while now, um, and uh, because we now are a member of ORCID, we were able to turn on a facility within PURE so that people can link up their ORCID ID or create a new one if they don't have one yet within PURE. Um, we actually saw quite an uptick last week. We sent out an email to all faculty, and part of that was information that Caitlin and uh, Jenny McBurney, who is also working on experts in communications, had, uh, they put together some information on how to do that. And when the email went out to the 6,000 people, a lot of people looked at it, and a lot of people added their ORCID IDs. Uh, longer term, we would like to see the university keep that information at uh, uh, at an identity management level, but that's where we are right now. And I guess just to add to that, um, so in our peer instance, um, individuals can push from their Experts at Minnesota profile into their ORCID account. Um, the inverse of that from ORCID into Experts at Minnesota, um, that does not occur. However, uh, this we feel is a really important step, especially in terms of awareness raising surrounding ORCID and why it is that an individual might want to uh, utilize that service. Great. Uh, and uh, Jan, we have another question here from Stephen who says, for reporting, it would be good to have IDs or unique uniform names for more than just persons, uh, meaning department centers. Um, so do, do your internal systems provide for that kind of standardization? I'm guessing that's sort of the uh, institutional hierarchy that's sort of coming from the data warehouse. Uh, it seems like there may also be a broader organizational identifier question there, but if you want to try taking it as a local question, can you start with that, Jan? Sure, I think so. <laughs> you know, that's an interesting thing. The, the way that we define and display uh, colleges, well, and particularly departments within colleges in PURE is really, um, it, it really evolved from what makes for a good public display. So uh, the systems of record have a department ID associated with them, and that department ID really is meant for financial purposes. And what we're doing is repurposing it into a way that makes sense for, for a public display. So, for example, a center might, uh, might actually employ only one person. Only one person is, is paid through that center. And yet we want to be able to show multiple people who are associated with that center as part of it. Um, and that makes using just our straight uh, internal IDs a little bit tricky. We do use them, but we map them to something that's going to make for a, a display that allows you to pull people together in the way that the deans, the department heads, uh, and the individuals want to see it. Um, as far as using the larger, the, the 
uh, uh, like an ISME kind of idea or something like that. No, we're not there yet. There's certainly a lot of advantage to doing that, but um, in order to keep our displays clean, we haven't gotten there yet. So there's another question here is, what do you see as the biggest opportunities to create efficiencies to help with this work? Hmm. To create efficiencies. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm looking at Caitlin. <laughs> oh. um, I mean, I guess from my perspective, I think a huge part of that is about the scalability of it and ensuring that we do have those individuals um, like our liaison librarians and other library personnel who have the level of familiarity with the system and with the underlying concepts necessary to really um, go out and engage with faculty and engage with users to not only ensure that the data is clean, but also to utilize things like the reporting module, for example, to see what functionality they can get out of the system. So I think that that is, yeah, as opposed to having more of a core group of people doing that work, spreading that work out and kind of operationalizing it as an element of the work that a liaison does and that libraries do. I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, to I'm, I'm reading the question now online, too, and it looks like the second part is about what are the biggest bottlenecks in time sinks. And I, I think I can talk about that a little bit, too. Probably the biggest bottleneck is getting data uh, in from our systems, our internal systems, and that gets easier all the time. Um, it has taken definitely some work to figure out how to bring data from our HR system to serve this purpose. Um, and and how to keep it as up to date as we can. Uh, so that's that's a, a bit of a bottleneck right now. Um, getting grant data in in a complete way. Certainly, we're using data from the SPA system in a way it really wasn't intended for. And so working through those issues has been probably our biggest bottleneck and uh, and our biggest room for uh, creating more efficiency as we go forward. And, and there's another question here from Veronica Webster asking, are you allowing for ad hoc groupings such as research groups not formally recognized in HR? It's a good question. Jan. Oh, that's an excellent <laughs> question. <laughs> yes, actually, as uh, that's one of the things I mentioned uh, as one of the stakeholders that has asked us a lot of questions. I meant to mention centers and institutes, and I just gave that example of uh, typically a center might have an employee listed mm -hmm. in the HR system. Um, but they have all these associated researchers. We do um, allow for people to group together uh, a bunch of individuals into one center, or even in one case we have uh, an initiative that isn't even a, a financial entity at all. We have an initiative where we're grouping together people for better uh, reporting and also for viewing online. The problem there, and the, something that we've been very careful about is we do not want to be in the situation of the libraries having to manage those relationships. So we've been working within the constructs of PeopleSoft to find ways to uh, allow the individual centers to maintain those relationships. Right now we do have a couple that we have done in an ad hoc way, but only with the idea that in the next few months the, the, um, the center or institute itself will be maintaining those through the HR system, not as uh, paid uh, assignments, but as a, a affiliates, basically, of that, in, of that uh, entity. Okay. Um, a question I have for you is um, sort of two-part. One is, how are you addressing the gaps in humanities and arts and some social science information? Have you done manual entry sorts of things? And then related to that, are faculty maintaining their own records? Is the carrot working? And uh, so if you can talk, both talk about that a bit. Okay. Do you want to? Um, yeah. Well, I'll start with the question regarding the arts and humanities faculty. Um, now, I will say that um, in the early stages of the project back in 2012, uh, we did engage in a manual data entry project, and we actually had student employees who uh, had collected the CVs of our arts and humanities faculty or selected individuals within those departments and manually entered that information. Uh, at that time, we were actually on a different iteration of this system. We were on SciVal Experts. Uh, with our transition to Pure, which occurred last August, um, we actually were able to uh, essentially 
enhance the system by allowing for other import options. So it's not fully automated, but now uh, individuals can log into their account and import from WorldCat, from Crossref, and from these other resources, um, as well as from citation management tools in order to enhance their profiles. Uh, and so we've been using that as a way to more effectively communicate this service for those arts and humanities and social science faculty members. Um, simply because we did feel like the manual entry data project was not really sustainable over time. Uh, so instead, we wanted to look for ways to um, essentially streamline the process and encourage that usage. I think it's safe to say that, that we are always looking for opportunities <laughs> to get uh, more data from the humanities. Um, whether it's getting people interested in maintaining their own or getting uh, people at the departmental level, departmental level staff, uh, motivating them, giving, giving them reasons why they could maintain within Experts at Minnesota the records for the faculty in their departments, um, anything that we can do to, to beef that up because it is a difficult problem. Um, and the second part of the question being, uh, are faculty actually maintaining their own profiles? Um, and that's actually surprisingly difficult to answer, I would say, in that, um, you know, certainly we can track how many people have made edits to their profiles, or we can state how many people have made direct inquiries of us for assistance with their profiles. Um, but that doesn't necessarily account for those individuals who look at their profile and say everything's A-OK. -okay. Uh, so there may be a little bit of a gap there. Um, I can say that in terms of the actual data that we're curating and questions regarding the profiles generally, and I would group um, our homegrown system manifold in with this because it's all the same data source, um, we receive probably about 300 faculty inquiries per year. Um, so we do have a sense that individuals are using it, but I don't know if you want to speak any more to. Yeah, it is something that we're assessing, um, actively assessing right now. We just sent out, as I mentioned, an email to everybody in the system last week, and we are tracking, okay, how many people have added a photo, have added their ORCID, have, uh, it, you know, what do the, the web stats look like um, for people going into edit mode to do something. Um, and looking for different ways where we can engage. Uh, we're definitely seeing that people are, but I can't tell you what percent of people are. And of course, I have no idea how many people might be going to the system and saying, it looks great, and not taking any further action because they look at their, their uh, set of data looks just fine as it is. Okay, so a follow-up question for me, and, and starting with an observation, is that Minnesota, like my previous institution, the University of Illinois, seems to be uh, at a, a point of um, what I'll just call messiness, uh, <laughs> uh, in that you have a lot of different systems, uh, but, you, but you're starting to see more integration between them. Um, when you look forward, you know, ahead five years, um, wh what do you think you might see? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, I will say that the vendors that, that we're aware of all seem to be looking at each other's business models and drawing things closer together. Everybody's looking for, um, you know, the ideal would be to have one system that just does everything. I don't know whether that's possible or not, but I do know that uh, Digital Measures is doing more with how could they have public displays of profiles. And uh, Elsevier is doing more with, well, how do we put, build in some things that support faculty activity reporting for internal use. Um, so I do expect we'll see the market draw closer together and perhaps we'll get to a point where, um, where the, one product does all things equally well. If that happens, sure, we would go to one product. But until we have, uh, we have that, where you could actually do all of the different things that a university of this size needs to do with one product, then we will be, have, we'll be licensing multiple products or developing internally. Great, and we have another question here from Stephen uh, asking, do you distinguish the roles contributors play in relation to publication and other works uh, related to either PI, author, editor, photographer, et cetera? 
Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Uh, no, we don't. Um, there, there is. Uh, it, it really depends on the metadata coming in. We're doing not doing anything special to it as it is. So you usually will see an indicator of editor versus author, but that's about as deep as it's going to go. Um, certainly, if Scopus starts keeping track of that sort of data, the role, I'm sure that that will be something that will filter through to Pure. And that's something we would certainly look for. Um, if Scopus does it, we'll certainly look for it in all of the import sources that we use um, and hope that they all do that. But until these sources of the data are ac accurately and, um, uh, and regularly tracking that level of information, I'm, I don't think we'll be trying to fill it in after the fact or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I would just say in terms of the PI question, uh, we do draw that information from Sponsored Projects Administration, uh, and we do display PIs as well as co-investigators, but we don't get down to the level of granularity of including things like key personnel, um, but we do rely on that system of record for those designations. And I've added a link here, which you may be interested in, with a, an initiative uh, in the global scholarly communications community called uh, Project Credit uh, that talks about ways uh, that publisher and publishing metadata can actually uh, collect and disseminate roles uh, for multi-published sorts of, of works. So that may also be something of interest. That is a very young initiative and is just beginning to be used in publication workflows. And here, we, I think we have time for this last question from Carrie. Uh, if you found an alternative vendor, would you lose the enhanced data? So the questions about um, future, if you wanted to change vendors, what are the migration issues? Yes, um, and that, I'm glad you, we have time for that question. I think that's an excellent one. Yeah, uh, we do uh, own the data, but we have to have a place to put it. And that's actually another motivation for the Experts Data Warehouse is that we can then pull the data out uh, as often as we want to and store it in one of our databases so that the data remains with us. Um, of course, we're getting a lot from uh, that automated feed, but there's plenty that's coming in just by our individuals too. Uh, there is no um, particular ownership issue of the data that's coming from Scopus. That's something we are allowed to archive as well, uh, but it is uh, incumbent on us to do it. Okay. Great. Well, we are at the hour, so I want to thank all of you for joining us today. We appreciate your attendance and participation. Note that we will post a recording of this webinar online and we'll let you know by email when the recording is available. Please feel free to share that. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you.